We're working together, brethren, in seeking to understand this matter of application in our preaching. I set before you in the previous hour the fourth of our seven axioms relative to all of our preaching. I gave you what I trust was a helpful description and definition of application in preaching. Secondly, I sought to demonstrate the scriptural basis for insisting on application in preaching. And now we come to our third heading, some guidelines for the cultivation of aptitude in application. And I want to lay before you four such guidelines that with the blessing of God will help us in continually cultivating aptitude in application. Number one, you must experience continual engagement in the disciplines of personal piety. The great principle of Proverbs 4.23 meets us at every turn in the work of the ministry. Solomon urges us, guard your heart above all that you guard, for out of it are the issues of life. If the Word of God is to be applied to your people in a way that brings it home to their own hearts and consciences so that they sense it is impossible to deal with the Word of God without having dealings with the God of the Word, it must begin with you, with me as preachers, as we constantly have such dealings with God ourselves. I remind you of the primary emphasis of the 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 passage that God breathed scripture is in that context intended to teach, reprove, correct and instruct the man of God that he may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work, even the good work of preaching that word to others. So we come back again to that rule that we confront again and again in any biblical view of the work of the ministry, that true preaching will rise no higher than the life of the preacher, or as it is expressed in the oft-repeated words, the life of a minister is the life of his ministry. Or as Dabney frequently states it, Eminent Christian character is the foundation of a preacher's power. Unless the preacher is one of those who's going to join the many who will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, to whom he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Unless we put ourselves in that category, the secret of our power in preaching begins with our own heart's dealings with God. When you begin to decline in consistent, warm, heart-searching, soul-ravishing dealings with God and His Word in secret, one of the first ways it will manifest itself in your preaching is in the applicatory dimension. It won't show up, first of all, in doctrinal declension. It will show up in weakness in the applicatory dimension of preaching. I love that passage in Isaiah concerning the servant of the Lord, of whom it is said, the Lord God has given me the tongue of them that are taught that I may know how to sustain with words him that is weary. He wakens morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as they that are taught. The Lord has opened my ear. It was our Savior's open ear that dictated what came out of his open mouth, or the words of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 15 and verse 16, thy words were found. And then he says, not I exegeted them or I passed them on to others, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy words were unto me a joy and the rejoicing of my heart. 
So then, my brethren, you and I must wage ruthless and relentless warfare to maintain the vigor of the exercises of personal piety, secret prayer, secret meditation and reflection upon the Word of God. It's humbling to me to look back and realize that my greatest struggle when God laid hold of me at age 18 is my greatest struggle 56 years later. When I got up this morning, the issue was there before me again. Are you going to go up in that study and have dealings with God as a Christian man? Or are you going to rationalize and say, well, God knows I have all these lectures and I must be... Yes, God knows. God knows very well that that's the kind of rationalizing that begins the erosion of the inner life. I have no warrant from God to suspend the disciplines of the cultivation of the inner man because I've got 13 lectures. Because next week there'll be this, and the following week that, and the following week another. And we can have a string of excuses, brethren. But if we are to maintain freshness and effectiveness in applicatory preaching, we must continually engage in the disciplines of personal piety. Listen to Bridges, who understood this and expressed it well. We need scarcely remark that this interesting style of preaching, he's talking about applicatory preaching, presupposes a personal acquaintance with these exercises and an individual interest in their privileges. It is experience alone that qualifies the minister for usefulness by enabling him to touch the tender strings of the heart and to suit his instruction to the different cases, trials, and circumstances of his people. When he has, as Witsius beautifully observes, not only heard something, but seen and handled and tasted of the word of life and has been taught not by mere speculation, but by actual experience what he has thus found out, he safely inculcates from the assured persuasion of his mind and applies to every case from his own knowledge of what is suitable to each. He must therefore expect his full portion of painful exercises, not only for his own humiliation, a most needful preparation for his success, but also like his divine master, and then he quotes from Isaiah 50, to give him the tongue of the learned, that he may know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. His taste of the innumerable trials, fears, complaints, and temptations of private Christians will alone enable him to prescribe the specific remedy for each varying complaint and to exercise the sympathy of membership with them all. I always tremble when I hear a young man say, well, I, I have a sense that uh, God is preparing me for a larger ministry. I say to myself, you young fool, you're asking God to throw you into the tumbler. You're asking God to bring you into baptisms of trial and testing because to the extent that we are able to say, here, I proved God's grace to me in this trial and in that trial. We are able to apply the word of God with power to the hearts of our hearers. Again, listen to Murphy. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself, is the scriptural rebuke for neglecting this duty. And the duty is, his heading, the pastor should cultivate his piety by preaching to himself. When the preacher delivers the message of God, he should never separate himself from his audience as if he were not addressed. He needs the communications of grace as much as his congregation does. His own experience of wants of sins, of trials, and of blessing should be brought into his discourses. His own faults should be kept in view and rebuked as sharply as those of his audience. 
Diligently should he listen for the voice of God as addressed to his own particular case and then reiterate that voice from the sacred desk. This rule given by another should ever be his guide. Quote, in your preparations for the pulpit, endeavor to derive from the subject on which you are about to preach that spiritual benefit you wish your hearers to receive. And he goes on expanding upon that and then concludes by saying, then if his discourses arise out of his own experience and are shaped so as to meet his own wants, they will assuredly also be applicable to the great body of his Christian people. So if we would cultivate increasing measures of usefulness and skill in application, here is the first requirement, continual engagement in the disciplines of personal piety. But secondly, you and I must experience continuous engagement in the disciplines of pastoral intimacy. It is obvious that much of what is found in the Gospels of the recorded discourses of our Lord and in the epistles of the apostolic directives to the churches grow out of real pastoral intimacy with men. When our Lord knows that some of his own disciples are vying for position and jockeying for influence, he gives them a sermon on humility. When he knows that the hearts of the disciples are fearful and unsettled, he gives them an extended message of comfort. John 14, 1 and following. When Paul learns from the household of Chloe of divisions in Corinth, he deals with it pastorally, addressing it head on. His awareness of Timothy's temperament, even his physical constitution, gives shape and ethos to his letters to his son in the faith called Timothy. And so it must be with us. If the truth expounded is to find its mark in applications which are presently relevant, you must know you must have some sense of the state of your people if they are confused, discouraged, if they are indifferent, presumptuous, tempted, distracted. You and I must seek to get under their skin and behind their eyeballs and then give our applications in terms of what we know of their real needs. When you're engaging in the disciplines of pastoral intimacy, You'll carry your people with you to the study and to your desk. And as you have worked through the disciplines of accurate exegesis and begun to hammer the sermon into form and structure that we trust is perspicuous, you're asking yourself, how will this that I'm seeking to construct fit John in his need and Mary in hers? and Mr. So-and-so in his. And so your mind will be drawn in terms of the avenues of application, in terms of the extent of your knowledge of your people. In our reaction to the shallow, shabby public preaching in our day, we must not overreact and so bury ourselves in our books, in our studies, and our homiletical disciplines to be out of touch with where our people are. And there are times when we may have to give up some dimension of study that would be profitable to us and possibly eventually profitable to our people, but that two hours spent in going into that home, making that hospital visit, will bring us into a level of intimate acquaintance that will be more than rewarded in our ability to give more definitive, pointed, relevant application in our preaching. Murphy writes, There are peculiarities of thought and feeling in every human breast, and also those which lodge deeply in the hearts of classes of society. There are national feelings which make his country dear to the patriot and the exile far from his home. 
The poor have a fellow feeling in their trials. Youthful affection has its strong and endearing ties. The inebriate sees strange charms in the intoxicating cup. Men of business are held by bonds not easily broken. Even fellowship in sin lays hold of the deep springs of the heart. It would be the preacher's wisdom to try to understand these feelings, to get near to them, to sympathize with them, and to use them in his efforts to bring the truth home to the conscience. He should put himself in the place of those to whom he preaches and get his heart to beat in unison with theirs and thus influence them by the motives of the gospel. And then he goes on in that entire next page to amplify that direction. Then he closes by saying something that I wish were true, and it may have been true in his day. He says, such preachers, and only such, will be certainly efficacious in such preaching as necessary to the filling of the churches. Were such preaching universal in our time, not only would our churches be filled to overflowing, but thousands would have to be built, for you may depend upon it. There's never a man who preaches intelligent truth and preaches it with a living sympathy with men that people do not flock to hear. I believe to bind your conscience to a statement like that would be cruel. We live in a day of apostasy. The light that has been in us as a nation has become horrible darkness. I'm convinced that in other days, some of you men would be busting down walls because of the kind of preaching you give your handful of people week after week, month after month. But the fact that we live in barren days does not change what our task is. We are still to give ourselves to it as though we were preaching to hundreds or even to thousands. And if we are going to have applicatory preaching that touches our people where they are, we must not only engage continually in the discipline of personal piety, but in the engagement of the discipline of pastoral intimacy. But then thirdly, if we are to cultivate our ability to apply in a telling way, you must experience continuous engagement in the disciplines of intellectual industry. Preaching in great measure, as I said yesterday, is an imitative art form. And you and I need to keep ourselves in touch with those who are and were masters of application, who cultivated the art of application in such a way that when we read them, there is a kind of spiritual contagion and our minds are opened up as we follow the track of their minds and see how they applied. Books, tapes, living preaching, it's in this area, of course, that the Puritans are of peculiar help to us. They were masters of deep, varied, comprehensive, and searching application, both in the what we would call the more negative aspect as well as in the consolatory and the comforting aspects of applying God's truth. And you have in your notes that article by Art Lindsay on the importance of application and it focuses particularly on the benefit to be received in this area from the Puritans. And I urge you to read that uh, article in its entirety. I'll not quote from it, but I would especially recommend as you're thinking of what men can I go to to learn from them and absorb from them something of this art of application. Certainly Matthew Henry, Brooks, Flavel, Spurgeon sermons are masterful illustrations of, of deep pastoral application He's able to take, as it were, the most timid sinner uh, by the hand and gently lead him to Christ. At other times, he's able to take the most hardened, insensitive sinner and put a bomb in his britches. And you see, sir, the, the tremendous uh, spectrum of Spurgeon's ability to do this. 
Richard Baxter, Calvin's commentaries. I mean, people have this misconception, the Calvin of the Institutes is all they know. Read Calvin's weekly sermons. That's what his commentaries are. Someone took them down in shorthand. There are only, I think, three in the entire set that went to print as literature. The rest is recorded sermons. Imagine that guy that was able to sit there in shorthand and take that out. It was fascinating to me the first time I read of this by the man named Parker, uh, who's, got, uh, who's a real Calvin scholar. And uh, you see the practical applications again and again in Calvin. And then, of course, uh, I can't say enough about Matthew Henry. And I want to read to you a quote from my good friend Jack Seaton who in his little church magazine that he used to produce when he was the primary leader in the ministry up there in Inverness, this is what he says in this article about Matthew Henry. This exposition of the whole Bible, of course, was only part of his literary work in things spiritual, but it overshadows everything else he wrote. And now Mr. Spurgeon seems to be saying as he takes a deep breath at the commencement of recommending expositions in his first lecture in commenting and commentaries, quote, first among the mighty for general usefulness, Matthew Henry. Few would disagree with him. How often when a passage has been exegeted in the study, expounded precisely to our minds, overlaid with all the science of hermeneutic and textual evidence, have we still lacked the one thing needful, that clothing of the whole with warm flesh and blood. And we found it in the pages of Matthew Henry. And that's precisely what he intended his work to be. Quote, When the stone is rolled away from the well's mouth, he says, by a critical explication of the text, still there are those who would both drink themselves and water their flocks, but they complain that the well is deep and they have nothing to draw with. How then shall they come by this living water? So he explains, some such may perhaps find a bucket here or water drawn to their hands, and pleased enough shall I be with this office of the Gibeonites to draw water for the congregation of the Lord out of these wells of salvation, end quote. That office has been well discharged as the testimony of generations of able men witness Isaac Watts, Philip Doddridge, John Ryland, William Romaine, Adam Clark, Robert Hall would all gladly take their stand on that. Robert Hall's biographer relates how that eminent pastor, quote, for the last two years of his life, read daily two chapters of Matthew Henry, end quote. Whitfield read through the commentary four times and often on his knees while Spurgeon designates William J. of Bath as, quote, Matthew Henry preaching, end quote. The great Mr. Henry, Whitfield called him, and all should want to add an amen to that. And then, of course, I must mention Jonathan Edwards. You've heard the statement, all of his doctrine was application, and all of his application was doctrine. When you want to find judicious uses of a passage. Read Edwards, and even if you're not reading him for the specific passage you're preaching, read Edwards to learn the art, the skill of proper application, extrapolating the principle that can be driven home to the conscience and the affections of your people. But then fourthly, here's my fourth word of counsel. If we would develop more and more skill in application, you must experience continuous engagement in the disciplines of homiletic sedulity. And that's where I allowed my, if not alliteration, my verbal parallels to get a little bit out of hand. I understand it. Disciplines of personal piety, disciplines of pastoral intimacy, disciplines of intellectual industry, and disciplines of homiletic sedulity. 
gave me a chance to show off a fancy word. Sedulous is the quality of working hard, working steadily, being diligent. And this aspect of sermon preparation will cost you pain and labor. But that's why you're set apart, to labor in the word and in doctrine. Some books, some themes, the preaching of some narrative passages are more obviously applicatory than others. Obviously, you ought to be able to find your applications a lot more simple preaching the last three chapters of Ephesians than the first three. (laughs) Because it is dense application of the glorious salvation of the new humanity that Paul has expounded in the first three chapters. So there will be books and places in the preaching of books, themes and Bible characters, aspects of narrative preaching where the applications, in a sense, just jump out at you. There are other times they are buried, they are hidden. But if you're convinced that you have not preached until you've brought the Word of God home to the consciences of your people, you will spare no pains to make sure that if anyone leaves saying, what was that all about, they will have an answer readily at hand. So we've considered together a definition of application, the biblical basis for application, these four basic guidelines for the cultivation of application. Now we come in the fourth place to take up some concluding observations and counsels concerning application in preaching. And I have eight of them to lay before you. Yes, and I will be done before the hour. Number one, make this aspect of preparation a matter of earnest prayer. Brethren, we're slow to learn that the rule of God's kingdom is that to which our Lord himself subjected himself in his voluntary humiliation. The Father says to the Son, ask of me and I will give you. The very thing that is his right, he must ask for it in order to receive it. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for your possession. We need to plant our feet again and again on such text as Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And how many times must it be written over our barrenness in the area of application? You have not, because you ask not. James 4 and verse 4. So my first word of counsel is, make this aspect of preparation a matter of earnest prayer. Plead with God that you might see the avenues from the text or theme into the lives and consciences, the affections of your people. Plead with God that in the act of preaching, as your mind is warmed by the friction of the truth you're conveying to others, and as your heart expands as you interact with your people in preaching, that God will give you arrows of application that you never thought of in the study. Often I write in my notes at a point where I just have a sense in the study there is more by way of application. I write in the margin, God, choose my arrows for me. Choose them for me as a reminder in the act of preaching that God may give to you even additional applications to encourage, to strengthen, to bring conviction and rebuke to your people. Secondly, second word of counsel, In working out your applications, remember, consider the real and diverse categories of people attending upon your ministry. Think of them in your preparation as well as in the act of preaching. And there's where the Puritans were of great help going back uh, to the art of prophesying, Perkins' work, etc., Remember the three main divisions of mankind. To some degree, they are present in every service. There is the church and the world, 
the visible people of God and the non-professing unconverted among you. Paul assumed in 1 Corinthians 14 that the uninstructed and the unconverted would appear in the assemblies of the people of God. Then there is the true and the false member of the church. Though charity may call them all what they profess, and that's why the apostle can address the epistles as though everyone in every church was the real deal, but he wasn't stupid. That's why he says to such people, don't be deceived. He recognized that within churches addressed as the saints in Christ Jesus, there were some who were false members. And he urged them, be not deceived. And you have that situation every time you stand before your people. And then thirdly, there are the various stages of growth among the true people of God. You have babes. You have young men. You have old men, 1 John. You have the well-instructed. You have the ignorant. You have those who are grieving the Spirit and their ability to receive truth is hindered, Hebrews 5, 1 Corinthians 3. John Owen said, There are many dangers to be avoided, that none who consider these things be troubled without cause or comforted without a just foundation. He was setting out the marks of the truly converted in relationship to dealing with sin. This is taken out of volume six. And so he said, many dangers to be avoided, that none who consider these things be troubled without a cause. He recognized you have some sensitive souls. Anything searching upsets them. But there are others who are comforted without a just foundation. We have some sheep here Then any time I've really tightened the thumbscrews on self-examination, I almost invariably go to them afterward and say, did you get through that all right? And it's a sign of growth that they can now properly deal with that kind of searching application without it disrupting them. But you want to make sure that you haven't disturbed them unnecessarily. Then remember, secondly, not only this threefold main division, but remember the distinct chronological divisions in the congregation. You have children. Once in a while, it's good to say, hey, kids, this is specially for you. And when you do that, you know that everybody else will get it. You don't want to insult them. But whenever you direct the children specifically, you know the adults are looking in. And that if the kids can understand you, they'll get it as well. But remember, you have children, you have teenagers. Keep this in mind, as Paul did, applying detailed instruction of ethical conduct. In Ephesians 6, he addresses parents. Then he addresses children. In Titus 2, he's even got the nerve to say, there's some of you there in the Isle of Crete, and you need Titus to address the old women. There's some admit they're old women. And some admit they're old men. You have a special word for them, for the young men. And you need to recognize that in your ministry. You have the aged on the threshold of glory. Young men filled with zeal and energy. Middle-aged, full of fears. As one stage is being sloughed off and another comes. Remember that in your preaching. And then thirdly, remember the distinct occupational or vocational differences. Again, Paul recognizes that in his epistles. He addresses a word to masters. He addresses a word to slave. He addresses words to widows, to mothers, to the elderly, etc. And brethren, we need to do the same in our preaching. What about the young housewife who's got kids all day long, mama this, mama that, mama the other thing, until she feels she's ready to pull her hair out. And she comes, in a sense, perhaps staggeringly weary into the congregation on the Lord's Day. What does God say to her to encourage her in the midst of her weariness as a mother? Single women living with the constant pain of loneliness. Some of them perhaps self pity, and they've not wrestled with the matter of the providence of God, shutting them up to singleness. What does the text say to them? 
that shop worker living under a most unkind and unreasonable boss. What does the text, what does the passage, what does the theme say to him as he gathers among the people of God? Listen to the counsel that Blakey would give us. In every case, the preacher is bound to decide the matter as in the presence of his master and is one lying under the most solemn obligation to present the truth in the most impressive form and with the largest amount of persuasive power. Be his method what it may, his business is to deliver his message and the right force of that word must never be evaded. Ask the soldier what is meant by the delivery of a charge. Ask the merchant what is meant by the delivery of a piece of merchandise. Ask even the letter carrier what is meant by the delivery of a letter. All will tell you that the thing in question must be lodged in the person or persons or premises of those for whom it is designed. The true delivery of a sermon in like manner means lodging it in the heads and in the hearts of the audience. There are always two factors in the process. First, the clear presentation of the truth, and second, the dynamical force sending it home. For efficacy, both depend and both depend alike on a heavenly power. But as no intelligent preacher dreams that since it is the office of the Holy Spirit to enlighten, it matters not whether the truth be presented by him clearly or confusedly. And no intelligent preacher dreams that because it is the office of the Holy Spirit to apply the truth savingly, he need not take any pains to make his message telling. That's our task to make it telling to the various divisions of people within the assembly, the various age and occupational categories. Now, of course, not in every single sermon. People will be there till 3.30 in the afternoon, and it won't be long before you won't be living in that parsonage or be a pastor in that church. But over the course of your ministry, your people need to know the man that stands in that pulpit carries me with him into that place. He's had me with him in his study. It comes out in his preaching. He's not preaching over me or to someone next to me. He is preaching to me so that in the course of an extended ministry, there is no class of people in the assembly who do not have the sense that they are in your heart. They are there. You love them. You're concerned that the word of God take up its residence in them. Third word of counsel. When applications are slow in coming, consult the proven masters in the way they handled the passage. And I've mentioned to you who those proven masters are, and this is where the textual indexes at the end, or indices, however you pronounce it, at the end of the uh, sets of your Puritan books of Manton and Goodwin and Owen will be most helpful. I have found at times some very, very helpful material it means sometimes a lot of looking up of things that don't lend any real benefit to you. On the other hand, you come across a jewel and it's been worth all of the effort. One brother writes, Next, after the Bible, read and study Edwards, whom to understand in theology accommodated to use will be as high praise in theological science as to understand Newton's works in accommodation to modern uses of natural philosophy. Study models such as Edwards in application. They are original, multiform, and powerful beyond measure. Edward Payson said of Jonathan Edwards, I aim to preach the truths of the gospel in a practical and experimental rather than in a dry and speculative manner. The books which I have found most useful to me are Edward's works, Brainerd's life, 
Newton's letter, letters, Owen's treatise on indwelling sin, mortification of sin in believers, and the 130th Psalm, that's what's gathered in volume 6, and Thomas a Kempis' imitation of Christ, translated by Payne, perhaps I ought to include Baxter's reform pastor and the saints' everlasting rest. Counsel number four, don't expect or attempt uniform density in application in every sermon. As I said, just as there are portions of the Word of God where the applications will be more profuse and natural in terms of the subject or the text, likewise, there will be in some sermons 20 minutes establishing the doctrine and 30 minutes in various applications. Other times, it may be a matter of 40 minutes of establishing the truth, isolating the doctrine contained, and only five minutes. Don't, in application, don't expect or attempt uniform density of application in every sermon. Counsel number five. Avoid a stereotyped and consistently predictable structure in your applications. You see, if people know that at this point in your preaching, invariably, now comes the application, they can steel themselves against the application. So surprise them. After heading number one, draw out the applications and drive them home. Avoid a stereotyped and consistently predictable structure in your applications. Counsel number six, make judicious use of searching questions in your applications. Judicious use of searching questions. And here, again, the Puritans were good examples. Listen to this sermon or the end of a sermon on the subject of justification from Trail's work. He brings these questions together in such a way that they just force honest, searching self-reflection. And your eternal state is to be determined by these things. What are your heart thoughts of the law of God? What are your heart thoughts of the righteousness of Christ? What are your heart thoughts of the grace of God? And everyone that knows truly what his inward sense of these things is may soon come to some conclusion concerning his spiritual state. But I shall speak more fully to these things the next opportunity. Well, you see, if you're driving those things home, Press them on your people. Dear people sitting here, don't treat this as just more preacher's talk. I want you to think seriously what are your heart thoughts, not what do you say that you know is proper. What are your heart thoughts of God's law? Do you regard it as Paul did? Absolutely righteous, spiritual, Good, the just requirements of God made upon creatures whom he made in his image. What are your heart thoughts of the law of God? Do you resent it? Do you have an attitude that, that despises it? Who is God to be telling me what to do and not to do? What are your heart thoughts of the law of God? What are your heart thoughts of the righteousness of Christ? The righteousness comprised of his perfect life, his death under the curse of the law, that righteousness which alone can answer to the demands of a holy and just God. What are your heart thoughts of that righteousness? Do you see it as the only thing in which you want to be wrapped up when you stand before the living God? What are your heart thoughts? Not what do you glibly say, my friend, but what are your heart? You see, press the questions until people are pinned, as it were, to the pew in self-reflection on these critical matters. Make judicious use of searching questions in your application. And then my seventh word of counsel is this. 
be prepared to pay the price of consistent, close, applicatory preaching. And I emphasize again, both in the more searching as well as in the more consolatory dimensions of that preaching. You'll be accused of arrogance in attempting to play God. I know, been accused of it. You will be accused of unbelief. You're not trusting the truth to do its own work. You feel you've got to help God by that kind of application. Well, so be it. You'll be accused of fanaticism when you demand that people feel something when you preach, that you're seeking to bring the word home to their feelings, to their wills, to their consciences. You'll be accused of browbeating your people. I know, been there, had that accusation. But if before God, Before God, you can say, Lord, I know that you alone can make the truth effectual in the heart, but you've laid upon me as your servant the responsibility to bring the word close to the affections as well as to the judgment and understanding of my people. Those who are the true people of God over the years will come to appreciate you and thank God for you And when you can have saints that you've traveled with them for 40 plus years as I have, look you in the eye and say, Pastor, we're going to miss you when you leave. Under God, you've kept us in the way to heaven. Then you say, let people say what they will. Let them say what they will. I'm going to present these people before my Savior as a chaste virgin. And you say, Lord, give me grace. With David, you say, I shall be yet more vile. So be prepared to pay the price. You'll be accused of all kinds of things. But then remember, Paul, it's a very little thing with me if I be accused of you or of man's judgment. And then counsel number eight. Pray for and expect additional applications to come in the midst of preaching. Now, if the Lord spares me and we continue these modules and I get into the section on the act of preaching itself, one of the points I will want to make is that there is a qualitative difference between what you carry out of your study in your manuscript, in your notes, in your outline, and what you should expect to happen in the act of preaching. And I will try to demonstrate biblically and experientially why I take that position. But growing out of that is this counsel with regard to application. Pray for and expect additional applications to come in the midst of preaching. When you're looking into the eyes of your people and you see a given individual, that you didn't think of their need in the study, but you know what some of those needs are. You couldn't carry all of the needs of all of the people in the full extent of your knowledge of them, but in the act of preaching, you see their eyes and and their spirit is reaching out to receive what Christ is giving them through you. And there on your feet, you see an avenue from the text or the theme that is answering exactly to their need. Well, you see, if you're not coming into the pulpit praying for and expecting additional applications to come in the midst of preaching, you will be tempted to quench the Spirit and to push that thing aside and say, well, no, that, that, that's, that's not in my notes. I, I can't trust myself to freewheel it and to wing it. No. Those are dimensions of the Spirit's operation, and you are God's servant. I have here in my notes to tell of an incident that happened years ago along this line. I was preaching on the life of Elijah, and I came to that section on Gehazi and Naaman, and the point I was making was that here in this passage, we have the record of a pagan who became an Israelite, and an Israelite who became a pagan. 
For that period of time, at least, Gehazi acts like a pagan. God is with his servant, but God doesn't see me when I go and lie to Naaman and take the goods from Naaman. And I pressed home that that is the root of our sin as the people of God when we become temporary pagans. And we act as though God is in some place other than where we are. And then when I got specific, it was the strangest thing. I felt impelled to take a woman and not a man. Generally, if I'm dealing with sexual uncleanness, I go after the men. But I said, you're a woman, a married woman. And you've acted like a pagan as though God didn't see you when you entered into that illicit relationship. And when you violated your... Well, I was after it. I wondered to myself, why did they say a woman? When I was done, we had curtains over the stage of a school we were meeting in, and I always had to walk behind them and down some steps. When I started to walk behind the curtains, a woman met me, threw herself into my arms, and she said, Pastor, I'm the woman. I'm the woman. I said, what are you talking about? She'd committed adultery. Her husband had no idea, no one knew. That's the kind of thing. Now that's a dramatic, unusual thing. I don't have that happening three times a month. <laughs> <laughs> but it underscores the principle, brethren, and lesser, less dramatic things have happened again and again. It's a wonderful thing when someone meets you at the door and says, Pastor, I was about to call you and set up a counseling session. But that application of the word this morning was exactly the issue I was going to come and see you about. I don't need to call you. Specific, pointed application. And many times you will have no idea how tailor-made it is to one of God's servants, one of his people. So brethren, in this matter, this is my eighth and final word of counsel. Pray for and expect additional application to come even in the midst of of preaching. And I have to confess that in the midst of so many pressures and responsibilities in these days, I've taught and preached myself under conviction that I've allowed this area of application to slide somewhat. And I come next time I stand in the pulpit determined to take my own medicine and do what must be done, that this aspect of the preaching never be neglected. God help us. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that we have your word as a lamp unto our feet and a light to our pathway. And as we have been wrestling and thinking, reflecting on this matter of our solemn responsibility to bring home the word to the feelings and to the wills of your people. We pray you would forgive us where we have failed, where we have not been willing to do the head work and the heart work necessary. Give us help, we pray, that your word will indeed come home closely and powerfully to the hearts of all of our people, week by week, month by month, year by year that we may help your true people on their way to heaven, and that we may be used of you to call out your elect. O oh God, we know that we live in a day of small things, a day when in great measure all around us you are giving men over to their sins, and there is apostasy in the church, and there is frightening moral declension in society. But our God, we know that our task does not change, and so we cry to you, give us grace to be the men and the preachers we ought to be, to the praise of the glory of your grace. Hear us, we plead, in Jesus' worthy name, amen.